Hello and welcome to another episode of Brave UX. I'm Brendan Jarvis, Managing Founder of The Space In Between, and it's my job to help you to put the pieces of the product puzzle together. I do that by unpacking the stories, learnings, and expert advice of world-class design, UX, and product management professionals. My guest today is Toby Dallimore. Toby is the co-founder of CoLab, a global community of hand-picked product professionals who are committed to lifetime learning. Through CoLab, members join a micro-community where they help each other to level up participating in safe, open, and honest conversations. By day, Toby is a product manager at Xero, where he provides product leadership to a cross-functional team of over 20 talented people, all working to deliver beautiful software as part of a global product that is used by over 2 million people. Before joining Xero, Toby was a product manager at Rome Digital, one of New Zealand's largest and leading full-service digital consultancies, where he led product discovery, validation and execution for startups and established businesses alike. Toby also invested several years at TradeMe, New Zealand's equivalent of eBay, where he evolved and established new products and product strategy, including launching a data platform that created new value for both the business and customers. Passionate about helping others to level up, Toby is also a mentor at Plato, a mentoring organization set up by alumni of Y Combinator, Paul Graham's world-famous seed fund and startup accelerator. And on this wintry day, Toby's joining me on Brave UX to talk about product management, strategy, and collaboration. Toby, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brendan. Looking forward to this conversation. Well, don't say that just yet. You don't know what my first question's going to be. No, that's right. It could all go downhill, but I'm excited. I think uh, there'll be some really good stuff to talk about with you. Indeed. Now, Toby, tell me, is it true that you like to run around fields wearing body armor while carrying a small ball inside a small basket that's attached to a big stick? That is true, yes, um, and it has been described in many ways. Uh, one of my best friends was nice enough to call it Quidditch, um, <laughs> but a lot of people are passionate about the sport of lacrosse, and I'm one of them, and I've been lucky enough to play it around the world, which has always been um, a great adventure and, and something I've really enjoyed to do since high school. I understand your first job was actually working for the New York Lizards, which is a professional lacrosse team. What was that experience like? Yeah, I um, took it on as sort of a, a summer job and that was really interesting. You know, I think in America, sport and, and sport management is so big. You know, you, you think of the, the big four in terms of places like the NFL and MLB. They're huge organisations. Um, so even to be part of a professional sporting organisation like the New York Lizards was really interesting. Probably the first taste I got of business and running a business um, because it wasn't like we just went to the sports field and, and threw a ball around with that stick with a net. We actually you know, were part of marketing it, part of ticket sales um, and learning how to build that business up because professional lacrosse was growing at that time. And so it was an exciting time to be part of that and probably a role I credit with sort of getting me interested in business and, and working to build up a business. Mm -hmm. And I understand since coming back to New Zealand and now you're obviously at zero and as I mentioned in your introduction, you've worked at Rome Digital and also Trade Me prior to that, but you've maintained your connection to lacrosse. I believe you're actually the chair of New Zealand lacrosse. You know, what is it about the sport and wanting to be involved in the leadership so much that has uh, captured so much of your attention and energy? Yeah, I, I think it's enjoyment and leadership that you can help influence change. Uh, and so when you're passionate about something, you know, and I'm passionate about lacrosse, if I can step into a role and use my skills and expertise and provide value towards change that's positive, um, then I think that's uh, something everyone should do if you get that opportunity, especially for community elements. So, you know, lacrosse is a grassroots sport and uh, there's no paid roles there. It's people who work hard on the ground to really build the sport so that others can come in and enjoy it. And we're seeing great growth in high schools across New Zealand. And that's what makes me kind of excited about taking on those roles is if I can build that out, other people get the opportunity to do what I did, which is 
you know, jump into a sport in high school, take you around the world, play in America, you know, play overseas. Um, so yeah, it's that passion to use leadership to, to drive change, which then goes on to create both value and enjoyment for, for other people. Um, so yeah, I enjoy those roles. Mm. And something else that helps drive change is coaching. And I understand you've done that both in sports and also in the professional realm. It's something that you've pursued quite a lot in recent times. I mentioned in your introduction, uh, Plato, which was a mentoring organization set up by some Y Combinator alumni. What is Plato and what is it trying to achieve? Yeah, and coaching, coaching and mentoring, you know, they have a slight difference, but I think ultimately it's the same goal, which is helping grow people. Uh, and Plato, I, I found, is a really nice platform that's sort of taking mentorship, which I think especially in New Zealand can be a little bit ad hoc and unstructured. Not that it needs to be really structured, but more than just catching up randomly and no real preparation or outcome planned. And so what I really liked about Plato is they've built this platform uh, that helps articulate your skills and your background, uh, either as a mentor or a mentee, and then start to connect people who have those common focuses. So uh, in terms of what I can do with Plato is sort of put forward what I have done in my past, what my experience is, the areas I work in, you know, even if it's just things like a SaaS business. And then mentees on that platform can find me and say, well, I'm working on a, you know, a SaaS product as a new product manager. And so I want to have that experience to lean into and, and ask questions about. And so what I think Plato's done really well is build that platform to provide the connections. And then something else I'm passionate about, which is the conversations between product people. That's the bit that, you know, myself and other mentors bring to the table is, is the unique conversations we can have with those mentees. But Plato's given that platform to allow it to happen and allow those connections to happen. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic platform. I, I really rate what they're doing and um, excited to see where they can kind of grow that um, sort of next level of mentoring and, and coaching beyond mm -hmm. the sort of casual just catch-ups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, and I want to come to CoLab of course soon, but I want to ask you about your participation as a mentor. You know, what has that taught you about yourself? Yeah, I think the first thing it, it teaches you is you don't have all the answers. Hmm. Um, you, you know, you, if you go into mentoring because you think you know everything and you're just going to tell people how to do it, that's never going to work out well. Um, so what it's taught me is, yeah, I don't have all the answers, but if I can help someone to think about something or, or steer them in a direction or ask them the right question to make them think, uh, I can help people realize that actually they know a lot more than they think or they have skills that they haven't trusted as much until someone really challenges them to, to do that. So it's, it's sort of built on my experience in sport with coaching, with leadership, to sort of understand that your role as a mentor is to come and help people reflect on themselves and what they're doing so they can look to understand and put forward their own next step um, and not just have you tell them what to do, you know, as you know, a manager or someone might do. So, yeah, it's really taught me that, that skill, um, made me reflect on how I do that, making sure that you don't, and again, this is something that I think when you're young, you get caught up in, which is just tell people what to do. You know, I know what to do, or I think I know what to do, so I'm going to tell you. And mentoring has given me that reflection that actually it's not about telling people what to do. It's about empowering them and helping them get the best out of themselves. Um, so that's, that's something I've really enjoyed, having gone through some mentoring now, both having mentors who have taught me a lot, but also doing mentoring uh, teaches you as you get into it and work with different people. Mm, sometimes you just have to sit on your hands and ask questions. Yeah, you do, and it's hard. And you know, I've got a couple of great mentees uh, here at Zero, and you know, I was sitting with one recently, and and she was asking, you know, well, how could I do this? 
And it's very hard to hold back that impulse to say, right, well, here's what I think you should do, you know, do A, B, and then C, because that's the way I would do it. And so the, the challenge is always that element of kind of holding back your own opinions and thoughts to th therefore go and just ask that question that gets them to think and almost think aloud through what it could be and uh, give that little nudge when it's needed. So, mm. yeah, it's definitely hard. I had a conversation with a fellow Kiwi, Robbie Allen, who was uh, in product until recently at Intercom, and we were talking around um, not specifically mentoring but about the um, – I suppose the vigor when you're younger in your career that you have and the passion that you have for being right and how often um, it's not always about being the one to be seen to be right. It's you've got to sit on your hands and you've got to be a bit more patient with people and, and sort of come to help them to come to their own conclusion. But anyway, this is about you. I want to talk about collab. It's something that I'm quite interested in and I'm sure that our audience will be as well. We were introduced by Lucas Coelho, who's the VP of Design at Rome. Now, I understand that you, Lucas, and a few others have been up to something lately, and as I mentioned, it's called CoLab. What is CoLab, and what is the problem that it's seeking to solve? Yeah. Yeah, we've, we've had a fantastic team that's been building CoLab. And CoLab is uh, something that we've, we've been experimenting with. We started very lean, just uh, simply putting something out into the community to see what people thought. And it was really focused on what can we offer that sort of empowers growing product professionals through collaboration. Uh, and we, we sort of are looking to solve this problem that I've actually had in my experience and Lucas and my other co-founder Adam had, which is in product it's, it's really hard to find that time to sit down with your peers and, and learn from them and talk about your experience and kind of get into the real world experience you have in product. There's a lot of content out there about product management that will tell you the best frameworks, tell you the best way to do things. Um, but on the ground, when you're practicing it, it's hard. And sometimes it feels like, why can't I do it in that perfect way? Or why doesn't that framework work for me right now? And that's because every product manager, every product person out there has a unique situation they're dealing with. And so for me, it was about how can we start to unlock some of this value that each individual product person has and leverage it through collaboration so others can grow from it. Um, so what we have sort of established with CoLab are these micro communities of product professionals and they're focused on coming together over a six-week program to foster growth, uh, talk about really key challenges that they choose, and then share their practices and experience around solving those challenges. And then around that, we're building a community that sort of is part of bringing those cohorts together and then leveraging them uh, to help each other throughout their day-to-day -day work. Mm -hmm. Tell me about this idea of a micro community. When when you say that, what what do you mean, and and what does that look like in the context of CoLab? Yeah, so it's a really interesting term because I think it's starting to come to the forefront a bit more, and we've we've seen kind of usual communities that are big, big communities. You got great ones like Mind the Product, and and it's you know a, a huge community of product professionals, which is fantastic. But these micro communities are very focused in on the people that are part of them. And to me, the, the slight difference that is, is quite powerful is the relationships. And so within micro communities, you start to build the relationships with the people in them. And you've sort of seen that maybe with something like a mastermind group or things like that. And by having the smaller community, the relationships build and they become stronger and with strong relationships comes trust and, and the sort of vulnerability to share challenges and things that, you know, you might not share in a wider community. Um, and so, yeah, for me, micro communities are, are the sort of sub-segments of the broader communities we see today, uh, but they're focused more on bringing together a smaller group of focused people who want to work together and I, and I think foster relationships as well as learning. Mm. 
Yeah, it sounds really powerful. And just how big are these micro communities that you're bringing together? So we've started with uh, cohorts of 12 product professionals. And, you know, again, it was sort of experimental. Was 12 the right number? Uh, would 20 be the right number? You know, we can, we can still experiment with that. But we're bringing together micro communities of 12 people. Uh, we found that works quite well. It's enough that in six weeks you're actually getting to the end of that with some really strong relationships. Um, and that was something that we were quite interested in because when people leave these six-week programs, it's not a kind of finished thing. We don't really want to be that program that's just churning people through and once you're done, thanks very much, we're looking for the next person. We want those people to come out of this with a network that they go on to use uh, for years afterwards. And, and we're seeing that where people are going through these programs and because it's 12 people, they are building that relationship where afterwards they're connecting and meeting uh, and reaching out to each other to use each other's expertise to help them. Um, so yeah, so 12, 12 people in our micro communities and our cohorts, uh, which has been a good number, but yeah, really interested as we build out CoLab and, and what we're starting to offer in market. You know, cohorts are just one of them. And as we offer more um, sort of value adds for product professionals in the wider product community, I'm really interested to see if those micro communities might be 20 people or maybe you have a really small one of five based on a specific uh, topic or particular focus. So, yeah, really interesting world to, to be playing in. Mm. I mentioned in the introduction that the premise of these communities is to have clearly professional conversations about product mm -hmm. in a safe and open um, and honest way. You know, what is Colab delivering that a lot of product professionals aren't getting in their day-to-day, -day, in their workplace? Yeah, I, I think it's that time to collaborate. Um, and I think, for me, collaboration and product management is a, is a really strong skill and something that brings a lot of value. And so when, when you're doing product, as many product managers will know, it is full noise. You have a lot on, you've got the fires burning, you've got the stakeholders asking things, you've got the team that needs information, uh, you've got a strategy to write that you were meant to finish last month. So it's all, it's all go. And what I always found was that that meant you didn't get the time to just look at what you're doing and learn more from others. And I think what people are getting out of that is that time to just sit down and have that space to have those conversations as well as that ability to just ask someone, you know, I might say, hey, Brendan, how have you tackled this before? And you can tell me right there, and that's going to give me an insight to sort of say, wow, okay, you know, I never thought of it in that way. That's really useful. I'm going to take that straight back to my work and apply it. Or, great, I'm not crazy. You're doing it the same way. That gives me this sort of sense of relief. And, you know, something that was really powerful to me that one of our members mentioned was that having gone through CoLab, he came out of it saying, I no longer have this imposter syndrome. You know, I no longer feel like I am sort of alone in this product world. There are other people out there who have the same struggles, who have the same challenges, and that makes me feel confident that I am tackling these things alongside others. Uh, even though we don't work in the same company, you understand the pain points and things I've got to go through. So to me, that's really powerful, you know, giving people that forum that allows them to have these conversations and talk and just share enough that they start to feel confident in their own roles and what they do. Mm. It almost sounds like peer coaching or peer mentoring of sorts. Yeah, I think there there is naturally that. And, and what's really good is it's not just mentoring because we put a facilitation structure around it and we pick key challenges you know so we might uh, one week talk about product strategy and the next talk about how you build great product teams you're actually having a bit of uh, focus and that's kind of I think what we're finding the balance with is allow people the space to talk and share their own thoughts and ideas 
but provide the framework and uh, a bit of structure that makes it valuable. Otherwise, it, it is just a conversation that could go anywhere and, and kind of might not be as valuable. So that facilitation really makes it stay on track, have a good focus and drive value into real elements of the product management role. Mm. How do you decide who gets picked to become part of a cohort? Yeah, that's probably the hardest hardest thing that we do. And, you know, we, we were really focused on making sure we could bring together a group and a cohort who could provide value for each other. Um, so we look to um, bring together the right group of people based on their skills and experience, um, diversity of thought and backgrounds, and really a balance of expertise depending on where they've worked or what they do or what we can kind of reflect on them um, being passionate about. Uh, we ask a few questions in the application process which give us insight into what people are looking to get out of CoLab. And so we want to make sure we bring together a, a group of people that are going to both connect well but also challenge each other well and bring thought or viewpoints that may not have um, been part of someone else's own experience. Mm. You mentioned diversity, both of thought and of background. Now, what uh, does diversity mean for CoLab and, and how do you ensure that that diversity is being reflected in the micro communities that you're creating? Yeah, I think it, it, it's important to us, right? It's important to have that diversity of people um, with different backgrounds and, and where they've come from and who they are. So, I, you know, I think we try and look at the, all the applications and, and select um, to, to get that really good balance, you know, whether it is just making sure we have a really good balance of male and female or um, different backgrounds of where people have grown up and, and the countries or ethnicities they come from. We want to bring those different viewpoints because it's not just, hey, what company have you worked for that's important in your diversity of thought? It's where did you grow up? What, what's your life story? And, you know, for someone like me, I grew up on Waiheke and then went to America and that's given me different thoughts. You know, Lucas, he grew up in Brazil and that's a different life and a different culture and a different diversity that he can bring in terms of his own thoughts and the way he approaches things. So... Yeah, I think it, for us, diversity is really important um, and it's something we try and, and do our best to balance um, across all spectrums. Um, so, yeah, I, I, you know, I hope we get it right and, and it's something that we continue to kind of challenge ourselves on and uh, I hope that we can just continue to have more and more diverse people coming into CoLab that help us build out that platform to be a, a diverse area of thought. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a really positive thing to be doing. It's also something that I'm consciously aware of on Brave UX as well. It was recently highlighted to me that there is a, a strong bias in my guess towards males and in particular white males. So something that I'm keenly aware of and working on as well. Now thinking about CoLab and the problem that it's trying to solve, what does that say about the predominant culture that your participants, your members, your micro communities, what does it say about the culture that they're working in? I think for, for some, it, it shows that there is a challenge within the culture they're working in to, to really have that product culture. Um, you know, we talk about sort of customer centricity and, and leading with the customer at the forefront or solving for customer problems. And, you know, not, not every business um, has that at the forefront of their thinking, and that can be a challenge. Um, I, I think also, though, it also doesn't point to just problems with culture. It's just such a, a busy and tough role in product management that it sort of points to, you know, and I do this myself, naturally the first thing you do is you cut your own growth and learning out of your time because you have things you need to deal with and, and priorities that you have to tackle. And so what I think it sort of shows is that 
people are looking for growth opportunities. They want to grow in their careers. They want to grow themselves and expand their kind of thought and, and skill set. Uh, but it's very hard to do that because you've got work, you've got life, you've got family. And so I think what we want to try and empower more of is a space for people to come in and do that and provide that quality of uh, growth that is worthwhile putting time into uh, rather than sort of taking a scattergun of doing multiple courses and hoping some of them stick. Um, I think we're trying to drive that ability to provide good use of time towards growth because time is valuable um, for product managers and we know that. Uh, so yeah, so to to your point, I think there is certainly some business cultures that are growing and still in their infancy in terms of having the right culture towards product and building out that customer-centric culture. And I think for others, there's just that personal challenge of putting that time into your own growth and where to go to find that um, chance to to have growth and learning. Mm-hmm. Well, let's let's go a little bit deeper into this predominant culture or the the reasons for why people might come to CoLab. I was reading on the website the following. As product professionals, we've found that the best way to grow is to learn through shared experiences. Informally, we've learned through friends and colleagues, creating our own internal framework of best practices. What was missing was a structure to validate these frameworks and to learn openly without judgment or fear of competition. Now, in particular, I want to focus in on judgment or fear of competition because I think this is um, something that we we may have just danced around a little bit when we were talking about the culture. You know, what what is it that you've seen out there between yourselves as founders and through the people that participate in CoLab that reinforces that fearful or competitive culture that's so counter to the product outcomes that we want to achieve as product professionals? Yeah, in terms of a competitive business culture. Um... Yeah, I'm just interested in what are those practices or beliefs or cultural norms that product people are having to contend with in their de- day-to-day that um, have made them fearful of having these kind of conversations openly within their own organisations? Yeah, I think it's it's definitely that challenge and, and pushback that you can get in a business uh, where as a product manager you, you advocate for your customer and you try and put that at the centre of what you think about. And, and that isn't to say that is everything. You know, there is the balance in product management. Your role is about working out the best balance of customer value to deliver business value. But I think in some cultures is that sole focus on revenue or sales. And so it can be challenging for a product manager to, to be that advocate and you know take that stand to say this is what we need to focus on and you'll get pushback and you'll get you know especially if you're a a sole product manager or product management is a small discipline within a company that's going to result in you sort of feeling like you don't get heard and that's tough when you don't get heard Um, and so if you're the minority in the company I think a lot of people try and talk and the more you get pushed back the harder it becomes and the less motivated and uh, safe you feel to provide those opinions and so I think when you come to a space like CoLab you you, as I said you have fellow product practitioners who may have those same struggles Uh, they may be a product manager in a startup that's trying to convince the founder around how to think about things and so you have that ability to help your approach through learning of others and what they've done and how that can um, work towards that. I think the other thing as well is that it's not just within businesses, but it's something that's not not a problem, but a part of a wider community where you don't know everyone or you don't have a relationship with them is that there is judgment, you know? Uh, and I feel it on you know, social platforms and, you know, I'll, I'll post something on LinkedIn and. I'm sure as many people do use sort of this fear of like, will people judge me for what I've said? Will they, you know, think it's silly or that's why am I saying that? 
And so I think there is also that in, in broader communities and in public forums where you don't want to just say, hey, I'm really struggling with this or, you know, I actually don't know how to write a product strategy. Could someone help me? Take some bravery to put that out. And I think what we're trying to build as in terms of culture is a space that feels safe to do that and say, you know what, I have no idea how to do this, guys. Could you help me? And um, it's been really refreshing to see we have a community for sort of the alumni of our cohorts. And the things people put in there are, are personal challenges and, and things that you have to be vulnerable to ask for help on. And I think that building of relationships and trust allows you to feel safe to, to ask those questions. Um, and so I think there's a, there's a slight issue and it's a bigger, broader cultural issue where um, you know, vulnerability and, and putting forward that you don't know something is always judged as therefore you, you know, you're not smart enough or you, you aren't good enough to be able to do that. Whereas it's just a learning curve, right? We don't know everything. You're just trying to learn and, and do your best. And if we could reach out and ask people for help throughout every forum, I think we'd have, you know, incredible learning and growth across everyone. Um, unfortunately, we are human and uh, sometimes humans can make mistakes and judge others. So, yeah, I think culture is super interesting and, and I certainly have never um, realised until we started doing collab like how much that is something people are, are looking for, is that safe space and, and that culture that allows them to speak up and, and be heard. Mm. Well, it sounds like what you're doing is going to be super important and super valuable for the people that participate in it, Toby. Just before we move on to another a topic that I have in mind, you know, who is this really aimed at? What sort of level of um, career product professional is this best suited to? Yeah, I think we've majority is sort of your mid-level product people who have had some time and roles and. I think gone through enough experience in their career to start understanding what is a challenge for them, what they found difficult. Um, and saying that we've had a, a whole range of product uh, professionals from uh, sort of product owner roles through to chief product officers. Um, but that sort of middle tier, you know, product managers, uh, people who've had two or three years experience in product has been good. It means that each participant can bring their own thoughts and ideas to the table they understand product a bit but they're still learning and so others help them learn in that way so that's sort of where we've started but I think as we grow we're looking to diversify and provide more focused um, offerings that allow for each stage in the product career to come in and, and get value. So I believe you're on to your third cohort uh, yes, we uh, currently have our fifth cohort um, open for applications at the fifth. moment. Fifth, yeah. Excellent. So, yeah. It seemed uh, like you were opening up different tracks as well. I saw that there was a leadership track and also there was a design, a product design track. Is that a fair reflection of what's going on? Yeah, those are two areas we're interested in, in starting to um, gauge people's interest, uh, I think. We've gone through this early growth of just testing that this could add value and be something that people um, enjoy and get growth out of. And that's sort of been validated. So now as we go into our fifth cohort, we're starting to look at, as I said, some of that um, diversifying of uh, what could be offered. So design, leadership uh, are things we're interested in. So if anyone is sort of in that particular type of role and interest in what we've been talking about, then we'd love to hear from them because we sort of crowdsource the um, the inputs to help us determine what we can build to add value versus just building something with the expectation people will have value for it. So, hmm. yeah, looking forward to seeing if we can kick those off. Yeah, and for everyone that's listening, we'll be linking to Colab in the show notes so you can find out more about those new cohorts and all that's going on at Colab there. Now, you mentioned, Toby, that something that you were interested in and had a passion for was enabling collaboration. You've said in the past, and I'm going to quote you now, through my time in product, I've learnt that creating successful products is hard. Why is creating products hard? 
Yeah, creating product is hard. And, and creating product is hard because it is made up of so many factors that need to come together to make it successful. Um, and even when you think you've got them all right, there's a factor out there that you haven't considered or just happens to come in that you know, makes it hard to make it successful. So your product is hard and it's also a team sport and that makes it harder because it means you can't just go and do it. You bring together different strengths and skill sets to enable a product to be successful and that can be hard to do. You, you know, humans are complicated, uh, both in terms of the teams that build product as well as customers. And so you need to understand uh, both that customer side, where you need to understand what your customers are, what's their motivations, what the value they're looking for from your product. And you want to understand what you need inside a business to create something for them to solve that problem. And I think that's something that people miss sometimes with product management is looking at that broader team within your business and sort of saying, well, how do we bring this collaboration together to ensure that our products are successful? And that's not just at a product team level. You know, we've got the classic product management uh, trifecta of design, engineering and product, which everyone will know well. But really, I think in, as you step into product management and product leadership, you need to be thinking about marketing and sales and customer support, all those elements are also teams that need to collaborate with you to ensure product um, success. So yeah, product is hard. It's hard because it's a team sport. It's hard because there are elements in there that are so intangible that you need to understand and, and take into account. And you have to roll with it. Um, it's a fluid, ever evolving, iterative process so you don't get a cookie cutter for product success to just stamp out successful products. Everything is different every time. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what makes it fun. Well, I've certainly found collaboration, particularly in the early stages of my career, was difficult being an only child. I've had some hurdles to overcome. <laughs> but I feel like I've rounded off a few, a few uh, sharp edges over the years. Yeah. Tell me, Toby, take me to a time where you remember collaboration in the context of product management really working well? It's sort of about taking, and this is something that I've learned, and um, Marty Kagan, who you had on the show actually, he sums it up really well, which is collaboration is not about consensus, um, which I think is important to note, you know, it's not about just making friends with everyone and feeling like everyone is your friend and, hey, we all agree this is an awesome idea. <laughs> and so for me, I think collaboration is when we were looking at Rome, we were working with our Good Nature of Wellington, a company that builds rat traps, self-resetting rat traps, um, quite a cool product. And we had to figure out how we're going to bring this rat trap to be a digital connected um, product. And that takes a lot of collaboration between the Rome team, the Good Nature team, uh, between the team at Rome and what we were doing. And that collaboration came in challenge and conversations, but ultimately understanding the outcome we wanted to get to. And I think what we did really well in that space is we define that early and we had agreement, okay, this is where, this is the outcome we want. Uh, we don't know how we're going to get there, but we agree on that outcome, both as good nature and Rome and together and as a team. And working through it, it was really successful collaboration in the sense that we had that common purpose, but expertise who worked with autonomy in terms of design or engineering. And that type of collaboration is I think when you start to know you've got a good team that can collaborate because they uh, know their expertise, but they loosely hold on to what they've created or their belief in it, and they can take on board feedback and, and sort of help shape that final outcome. And it was it was really good. It, you know, that was a time where I sort of saw a team work well together, solve problems, solve challenges. You know, you're dealing with Bluetooth technology, there's a lot of challenges that come through. 
uh, and ultimately come out the end of it with a really great product that, that worked really well. So tell me, you've just described what good collaboration looks like. You've talked about the ability for people to be able to challenge one another but holding their own opinions or perspectives loosely. What is an example or what are some of the things that people should avoid or look out for when they're trying to set up and frame an effective collaboration on product? It's a good question. Um, I think it's it's avoiding that thought that collaboration is uh, just feedback and acceptance. Mm. You know, not starting out with this concept that what you're trying to do in terms of getting collaboration is just get people to agree with what you're putting down. Mm. Um, it is about understanding and helping others understand that collectively everyone is going to play a part in building the success. Um, you know, so if you're a product manager out there, it's making sure you understand that you're not the shining light or the knight in armor leading the charge. You know, you're really that person that, that works to bring others in, empower them, lift them up and get them to share the expertise because any good team is built up of experts in their own right of something, um, but they need other people's viewpoints and perspectives to help balance it all uh, collectively. So, yeah, avoid that mistake of thinking you've got the answers or you're the product manager, so therefore you need to come up with the ideas. Instead, focus on understanding your team, their strengths, their skill sets, and building, again, this kind of comes back to the, the concepts around, I guess, collab, but, but building that trusted environment where you're not just friends, but you have the trust to challenge and you can loosely hold on to what you believe is the right idea so that when good information or good challenge comes across, you can adapt to that and change. Um, if you are rigid with your ideas and your concepts, that's where I think it starts to break down and collaboration uh, quickly goes out the door. Well, I also liked when you mentioned describing the collaboration at Good Nature, also being clear on what the outcome is that you're trying to achieve. I feel like that makes it much easier to discuss the various merits of people's perspectives or ideas when it relates to feeding into where the product might go. Yeah, and that's that's something that we've also had here at Zero. You know, been working uh, across five teams, uh, including a UK team. And, you know, that's a massive time difference night and day. How's and that going? It's going, you know, really well, apart from the large bags under my eyes. Um, <laughs> and I believe you've also got a six-month-old uh, baby in the house, so <laughs> I, don't envy, I don't envy that position. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sleep is, uh, sleep is rare. But, you know, that was another great example of, of bringing together teams under a collective outcome an agreement that that was the collective outcome, but the autonomy to execute it within their domain of expertise. And that, I think, really helps you get that successful collaboration because everyone knows what you're trying to achieve and get to, and, and they don't just know it, they agree that is what it is. Uh, but they haven't been dictated to how to do it. And so each can dive into their world and help solve it. And at Zero, we had, you know, the UK team working on their part and, and really, you know, doing a great job there and then bringing it to the wider team and, and a team could challenge that and they would take that away and, and think about it and vice versa. So that's worked really well, you know, both at Good Nature and Zero. And I think that's, you know, something that product managers sometimes need to remember that sometimes your job is just to help align everyone so they can bring their expertise. You don't have to solve it. You don't have to come up with the perfect you know, plan around what and who is going to do what. Bring people on the journey, align them against that common goal, and make sure they believe that and understand why that is the outcome required. And then you will start to see their expertise come through and they will do a fantastic job because that's what they're great at. Mm. Product management doesn't always just involve the team or teams that you're managing either, does it? It also involves interacting with stakeholders, which may be more senior or in other teams that are outside of the product organization. It's sometimes referred to as a role, the role of product manager as a 
position where you need to influence without authority. What have you found that has, firstly, is that true in your experience? And if it is, what have you found that has worked well for you in having those conversations with stakeholders, getting their support and buy-in and keeping them aligned behind the outcome that you're trying to achieve? Yeah, influence without authority is very true. Uh, I think it's a good way to sort of describe the the role of the product manager, which is you're, you're not the boss. You're not the the dictator of do this and it shall be done. Um, and so to me, a lot of it comes down to this storytelling power of product managers. And that comes from this kind of cross-cutting viewpoint that you get to have. And as I've just talked about, there are expertise in your teams and across the business that you can really bring together for a collective outcome. But your sort of superpower in product is you get to be across all of them and you start to build understanding of the business, of the customer, of UX, of engineering, not at the deep level of the experts, but at a good enough level to start to understand what needs to happen across all of them. Uh, and, and the critical part of that is the storytelling. So helping stakeholders or different parts of the business understand what you need to do to make an impact. And that comes through helping them understand the impact probably at that customer level, that story about how the business will go into creating something that solves a problem for a customer that is therefore going to drive the value in that business. Uh, so I really think it's that storytelling element. And the thing I, I tell my team about is don't just come and tell people this is what we're going to do. Bring them on that journey to understand the story behind it and why it's important. And if you can do that, I think you get people on board and have their buy-in a lot more um, than just putting up the slide deck that says, you know, roadmap A, we're going from here to here, you know, we'll see you at the end. Um, so, yeah, storytelling. <laughs> I was going to say, and whatever you do, don't tell me that there's something wrong with my roadmap because it's been finalised. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't you dare diss my roadmap. Uh, <laughs> I've beautifully crafted it. I've used some nice colours, and I quite like it. So it's not changing. Yeah, I'm Classic. starting to think that. Uh, only children probably don't make the best product managers, but that's just a suspicion, a hypothesis. I haven't validated that. <laughs> we talked about strategy a little earlier on. I think you mentioned product strategy. When was that something that became part of your career or part of your role as a product manager? Yeah, the first time product strategy really came to the forefront uh, was when I was at Trade Me and we built out a property data platform, um, which sort of gave people insights into uh, property pricing and, and what a property might be worth, you know, a very topical uh, thing here in New Zealand. And we built that platform and it, it was great, you know, a great product, um, brought it to the market and was successful. And then that was the point, you know, as a product manager, I realized, well, what next? Uh, you know, where, what path do we go down? What is going to be required to make this successful? And ultimately, what is the outcome we're trying to achieve over the next sort of three, four, five years? And so that's where I started to realize, well, product strategy. Uh, that is a key part of a, a product manager's role, more so than making sure a product is launched, I think. Um, and that was the first time I sat down and uh, started a blank piece of paper or a blank slide deck and, and, and sort, of, sort of product strategy. How do I do this? Mm. Um, so, yeah, it is, from, it's, a, from it's an interesting topic. It often is a, a, is a term or a thing that I find um, is quite difficult to ground, as in just exactly what it is. Mm. When you took out that blank piece of paper and that pencil and you started to think about, okay, well, how am I going to take this product forward? What does it look like in the future? You know, all those big strategic questions that you just mentioned. Did you initially think that what you were doing was product strategy? I, I think I knew that it was, you know, the term was product strategy. What I was doing was not product strategy. Uh, <laughs> Tell me about that. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think when you, f without the kind of understanding of strategy, because strategy is, is a bigger, broader um, 
topic, it's, it's knowledge in terms of how you do it and, and what it looks to achieve. And so at that point, I, I didn't have that. So to me, I was thinking, oh, product strategy, that's what I do. And really all I was creating was a plan, um, which is a lot easier to do because it is just step one, two, and three. And it, it, I think that's a common thing that, that you fall into with strategies. You think, I just need to create a plan. Uh, build feature A, then feature B, then feature C. Outcome being, hopefully, customers love it. Um, but strategy is not a plan, and and I think that's what I learned through doing that was as I dug into it more and more, I started to realize, okay, it's not just about what we need to do, but the why behind that. And it probably wasn't until um, I read a, a kind of classic and mentioned before book on strategy, which is Good Strategy, Bad Strategy, um, which I highly recommend people read. It's it's big, it's broad, it's focused on business strategy, but it's going to ground you in the fundamentals of strategy that allow you to look at a product strategy and really determine what you need to answer to create a good product strategy. Um, but the part I always really like from it and that I kind of refer to is a really simple crux of strategy when people ask me what is product strategy is just defining where you will play and how you will win. And those were the things at that time writing that strategy I didn't know or, or mm. think about. I thought about the plan, but I didn't think about those t two key kind of concepts. I think uh, there's something interesting. There's many things interesting in that, actually. But something about the context of when you were starting to do that work is interesting. And I suspect that this is something that is shared by many, many other people around the world, which is clearly nobody else in the organization had a good grasp on what the strategy was for that platform either otherwise you would have known about it and you wouldn't have been wrestling with those questions yeah yeah i think there's sometimes that thing where there is that is your thing so you know you, you've got to work out what we're doing with it um and maybe there is a higher bit of strategy around it you know in a business with that sort of layers of strategy um but yeah it, it can certainly just fall on your shoulders to work out how you're going to create a strategy that achieves those bigger broader business outcomes that are defined in a business like trade me or zero and uh, that that's quite daunting when you're staring at a blank piece of paper saying well how do i do this uh, is it is it fair to say that when in a product manager's career they start wrestling with or be get, being given the opportunity to wrestle with this question of what is the product strategy that they are entering the phase of their career where they move from management more into leadership yeah i think so i think um when you start looking at strategy you you are moving into leadership because and I, I, again, I, I like sport analogies. So to me, it's sort of moving from being a player to being a coach. And when you're a player, you, you just are on the field and you just, you got to execute, you got to do your role, you do your job. Um, when you're a coach, you need to be thinking in broader and, and longer term about what is the game plan for that next game before it's even played. And so how are you going to win based on those factors like another team or the conditions or the skills and strengths you have in your team how do you leverage all those things factor all those things to put a plan in place that is hopefully going to help you win now the key part to that is you're not the player who executes it and i think that's a good reflection into leadership which is you may come up with that strategy in the plan which is going to help to find how you could win. But ultimately, there's someone else who's gonna be that player who executes it. Um, and so your role becomes critical in the sense of leadership where you're defining the game plan, but you're also now starting to coach, empower, enable others, your players, to come in and do the best they can to execute that game to win. I really like that analogy, really do. Toby, are you ready for a couple of scenario-based questions that might help product managers that are experiencing a relevant scenario that I'm going to ask you about? 
Yes, yes, we put some good scenarios into our collab sessions and I've always been jealous as the facilitator that I don't get to dive in and answer them, so this sounds fun. Well, now's your opportunity. You're yeah. on the other side. <laughs> Are you ready for the first one? Yes. Okay, here we go. You're a junior product manager and you're having trouble getting an important business stakeholder on board with your team's ideas for evolving the product. You've got another meeting with them tomorrow and you want to make the most of it. How should you approach that meeting? Yeah, always, always tough. Um, and with your meeting being tomorrow, you know, that's coming up quick. I would say work to to understand that stakeholder and, and build a relationship with them so you can have a, a conversation with them about it rather than telling them what you want to do. Um, but what I'd say is, is go into that meeting with less of a plan to present what you are going to do and go into that meeting to start understanding what that stakeholder uh, is looking for from their side of things. What do they need to be done? What are they trying to achieve? So you can understand that first to therefore look at what you're doing and help them understand how that may even drive some of the things they're looking to have outcomes on. Um, I think a common mistake you can make when you are a junior product owner or someone just kicking off into product is you think your job is to turn up and present the solutions and how it's going to happen um, and it's not. Your job is to go in there and understand what your stakeholders might need, what they need answered, and then adapt to provide them the information that you have uh, to answer those questions. So, yeah, ask them. Cool. Yeah, bring a bit of empathy to that conversation. Yep, love yeah, love it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Are you ready for another one? Yes. Well, this will be our final one, so second and final one. Okay. Here we go. A fellow product manager has become interested in product strategy and wants to meet with you as you're known as someone who has a good grasp of the subject. They tell you that the things they've been reading make sense to them, but they're struggling with how to apply them in the day-to-day. -day. What do you say to them? Yeah, applying theory to real life is hard. Um, and I think that's because it doesn't always work first time. Um, so what I would say is two things. One, don't give up on the first try. There is a reality to trying things in real life that sometimes you have to try a, a few times, understand constraints and what's affecting it to adjust and, and kind of work through it, as well as you just learn. You iterate, mm -hmm. you learn, and you'll get better as you practice it. Um, and the other is to consider any of your unique factors. So while a book may tell you this is how you write the perfect strategy. You may be in a different business, you may be in a different scenario. You mentioned uh, broader business strategy and the influences that could have on it. So understand those factors for your unique situation mm -hmm. and then work those into what you're doing and don't feel disheartened if you can't do it the perfect outlined way that an article or a book may tell you, so long as the outcome that you get to is a successful one. Mm. Good advice. Always contextualize. Very, very <laughs> true. Toby, I am conscious of time. We need to bring this down to the close. So my final question for you is, over the coming years, what is your greatest hope for all the talented people who make products? I hope to see uh, product people really start to shine in businesses and we see it at some of um, some great companies around the world where product is helping lead those businesses to great success. Mm -hmm. And I hope we see that just grow and product become one of the disciplines at the forefront of business success. Mm, that's a great note to wrap things up on. Toby, thank you. This has been such a great conversation, packed full of practical insights for people to apply in their product practice. Thank you for so generously sharing those and your experiences with us today. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks so much, Brendan. Uh, fantastic conversation. Really enjoyed it. And uh, look forward to chatting to more product people out there and understanding what they're doing in the world of product. You're most welcome. And Toby, if people want to find out more about you and also about CoLab, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, best uh, follow me on uh, LinkedIn. You can find me there. That's probably where I spend the most time um, talking about things. But I'm also always up for a conversation or a coffee and in person or online um, so I can share a calendar link where people can book me in for one and you can also follow CoLab on LinkedIn 
and just search for it, all capitals, and uh, check out collabcohorts.com. And if you're really interested in joining a cohort, we're kicking one off uh, in June, so get in touch. Excellent. Thanks, Toby. We'll be making sure that we link to all of those great resources for everybody. And to everybody that has listened, it's been great having you here. Don't be shy. Get in touch with Toby. Have a look at Colab. If it sounds like it's something for you, then do apply. And if you've enjoyed the show and you want to hear more great conversations like this with world-class leaders in design, UX, and product, don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe. And until next time, keep being brave.